Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ed McPherson from Los Angeles. I'm proud to be part of the Miller team for the last 19 years, and my topic today is adult knee reconstruction. These are my disclosures. Uh, I'll start off with arthritis. Uh, as you know, arthritis starts with pain with weight bearing, aggravated with stairs, hills, sit to stand. Boring deformities are seen later in the presentation, especially of various thrust causing instability. X-rays are still the standard. Uh, weight-bearing X-rays are very important. If you don't see anything on the uh, weight-bearing APs, the next step is a 45-degree flex P to A, which we call the notch view. Also want to look at the kneecap with the sunrise view and extension. And remember your flexion laterals, as some people have flexion arthritis more than they do in extension. These are X-rays, weight-bearing AP, nothing too much going on here. You can see the degenerative changes. But if you look at the notch view, you can see that it's completely bone on bone, so don't forget these x-rays. For treatment, for the test, we want to follow the AAOS evidence-based guidelines based on meta-analysis and level one and level two studies. Look for the yes answers and no answers. Self-management program with strengthening and low-impact activities, yes. Weight loss for BMIs greater than 25 uh, is yes. Acupuncture, uh, no. Uh, lateral wedge insoles, no. Glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate, no. Conservative treatment, inconclusive physical agents, manual therapy, and, and unloading braces. You will not be asked about inconclusive uh, statements. That's not, it's too vague for the test. Pharmacology, uh, non steroidal anti inflammatories, definitely yes. Tramadol, yes. Inconclusive, acetaminophen, opiates, and opiate pain patches. There's too much controversy in terms of the risk and benefits, so you won't see this on the test. For procedural treatments, hyaluronic acid injections, no. Needle lavage, no. Inconclusive, intraarticular steroid injections, growth factor with PRP, again, too controversial for the test. Surgical treatments, definitely yes. Valgus osteotomy for medial compartment arthritis. Arthroscopy with lavage and debridement, actually no. Uh, interpositional free-floating devices like the unispacers, no. Inconclusive arthroscopy with medial, uh, with a torn medial meniscus, usually no because in advanced disease uh, there's overload and the meniscectomy is not going to help with the pain and long-term survival of the joint. So that's inconclusive. Moving on to osteotomy, the best indication for osteotomy, the age is slipped uh, downward, uh, less than 50 years of age, most likely to succeed when the disease affects predominantly one compartment. For the medial uh, knee arthritis with a varus knee, al knee alignment, the answer for the boards is a valgus producing proximal tibial osteotomy. Why? Because the deformity typically affects the proximal tibia where you have a proximal tibial vera. Remember with these osteotomies, the goal is to maintain a joint line perpendicular to mechanical axis with the center of head going through the center of the knee and center of the ankle. So you correct the deformity, which is the tibia. For a valgus knee alignment, we perform a varus producing supraconar osteotomy. Why? Uh, again, the deformity is typically lateral femoral condor or hypoplasia, and you want to correct the deformity to maintain the joint line perpendicular to the mechanical axis of the leg. Contraindications for osteotomy, inflammatory arthritis. It's been asked on many questions in the past. That's number one. You need a minimum of 90 degrees of flexion, cannot have a flexion contracture over 10 degrees, can't have any instability, especially a varus thrust. That really means that your lateral compartment is stretched out and there's instability throughout the knee. Lateral tibial subluxation, another good test question, greater than one centimeter medial compartment bone loss, and I will show you on the next slide, lateral compartment narrowing, especially on stress radiographs. So always remember to do the stress radiograph. Sometimes it's very surprising how much that joint space gets uh, narrowed. This is bone loss. You can see the double concavity. Look at the arrow there. You can see a double convex. That means that you've lost the bone on this side. If you look at the lateral view, uh, there's subluxation of that medial femoral condyle. The knee kinematics are permanently altered, and you really want to avoid an osteotomy in this type of scenario. The main problems with osteotomy are, involve the technique itself with a closed wedge technique. The problem number one is patella baja and loss of posterior slope. With the open wedge techniques, again, number one problem is patella baja, loss of valgus correction, 
uh, as the uh, open wedge tends to collapse and then non-union. For the varus producing femoral osteotomy, you need a uh, at least a valgus deformity of greater than 12 degrees to really make it work for you. You want mildly symptomatic patellofemoral disease. That's acceptable, but anything worse than that uh, usually should indicate significant patellofemoral disease. Mild disease improves because the patellofemoral mechanics are improved when you uh, reduce the Q angle. Again, the uh, uh, number one contraindication is inflammatory arthritis. You need 90 degrees of flexion, no significant contracture no instability, especially of valgus thrust, which tells you that there's ligament stretch out. Femoral tibial subluxation is another contraindication. Also remember the medial meniscectomy. If you have a medial meniscectomy, that's too much overload when you do the osteotomy, and that's a contraindication. And also do your stress radiographs to make sure that there's no medial compartment narrowing. Sometimes it's very humbling what you'll see with a stress radiograph. Moving on to unit compartment replacements, this involves primarily the medial compartment replacements. It's a quicker recovery compared to total knee and osteotomy, less short-term complications, overall better function than osteotomy, smaller incisions, shor ho shorter hospital stay, with less post-operative pain. There's a high rate to short-term to mid-term satisfaction, but remember, long-term survivorship is not comparable to total knee compared by revision rates. Again, the number one contraindication, they hit it over and over on test questions, inflammatory arthritis, significant fixed deformity. You must be able on a unique apartment to correct the knee to a normal valgus alignment on the clinical exam pre-op to make sure that these ligaments aren't uh, significantly scarred down. You can't do the releases like you can in a total knee. A previous meniscectomy in the opposite compartment is a contraindication. And remember this one, ACL deficiency is an absolute contraindication for a mobile bearing unit compartment replacement. We need flexion contractors under 10 degree. And again, if you have tricompartmental arthritis, uh, that mean indicates that a unit compartment is not going to work for the rest of the, uh, of the knee arthritis. Therefore, patient selection is key. You got to look at and recognize the patient's pain. If you are doing a medial compartment uni, you've got to think about having the pain localized to the medial side of the knee. If you have anterior knee pain, that means significant patellofemoral disease. If you have diffuse or global pain, that means tricompartmental disease. So look at the test questions and see where they're asking where the pain symptoms are when you, before you jump to making the decision for a uni compartment replacement. The main complication that you will see on test questions is stress fractures. This is for the medial compartment uni. It's on the tibial side always. Usually it's a uh, patient with heavy weight and high activity. They do really well post-op. Uh, they really start uh, ramping up their activities. They have a pain-free interval, and all of a sudden they have the spontaneous onset of pain. They've done too much, uh, and they have a stress fracture. You aspirate the knee, and it's blood. So those are treated conservatively, and if there's fracture uh, displacement, then you've got to think about fixing the fracture or revising the unit compartment replacement. Failures with unit compartment replacements, overcorrection causes disease progression on the opposite side of the knee. Undercorrection means implant overload with subsequent failure of the implant. For isolated patellofemoral arthritis, I know that patellofemoral replacements look sexy, but total knee is the recommended choice for older patients. It's a superior functional result compared to patellectomy or patellofemoral arthroplasty. Moving on to total knee, the goals, number one, restore mechanical alignment, restore the joint line, balance ligaments, normal Q angle. If you obey all four of those rules, everything turns out just fine. For ligament balancing, this is important for the overall function and survival of the implant. We'll look at the coronal plane balance, which is the varus and valgus releases. Also, sagittal plane balance, there's a lot of test questions with this. We want extension and flexion uh, balance. Um, we call that balancing uh, the gaps. For coronal plane balance, we uh, focus on the coronal plane with varus and valgus releases. We want equal tension on the medial and lateral compartments, test and extension and flexion. That gives us equal load on each side of the knee with good bearing survival without subluxation. And this example with a varus knee, the, the simple procedure is uh, number one, you fill up the loose, loose side, which here is the convex side. The ligament is loose and stretched out. Since we can't tighten the ligaments, uh, we fill up the loose ligaments until it's taut. 
on the concave side, the ligaments are tight and contracted, and so the second step is to release the ligaments on the tight side to equalize the gap. So for a varus deformity, you fill up the lateral side, which is stretched out, and the medial side is tight, and that's where you will perform the medial compartment releases. So conceptually, this is a varus knee, tight side is concave side, this is where you'll do the medial release. The varus releases in sequence, number one, osteophytes, number two, deep medial collateral ligament, also known as a meniscal tibial ligament. Next, you move on to the posterior medial corner, and then lastly, the superficial medial collateral ligament. And remember, this is where you're going to see the uh, differential releases for the test question. Specifically, the anterior portion of the knee uh, medial collateral ligament is tight in flexion, and the posterior oblique portion is tight in extension. So look in this diagrammatically. This is the superficial medial collateral ligament. The posterior, port, posterior oblique ligament is tight in extension. You flex the knee and the anterior portion becomes tight. So for the releases, you perform uh, a release on the posterior oblique of in this area and the anterior portion is released in this area just underneath the pes and serine tendon. For the valgus knee deformity, you fill up the medial side until the ligament is tight, as this is the stretched out side. The lateral side is tight and contracted, and this is where you'll perform the uh, compartment releases. And remember, with the valgus deformity, always be cognizant of the perineal nerve, which is located just behind the fibular head. With the valgus deformity, you can see the convex side is stretched out, the concave side. Uh, this is the tight side, and they are going to perform the lateral releases in this area as well. With the valgus release in sequence, number one is osteophytes, uh, number two is capsule along the side of the knee, palpatius and iliotibial band are next, and this is where you're going to see the differential releases. And lastly, the lateral collateral ligament. The lateral collateral ligament controls both uh, the tension in extension and in flexion, but it's these two with the star where you're going to see the differential releases for the test question. Specifically, the iliotibial band is tight in extension, the palpatius is tight in flexion. Looking at this diagrammatically on the lateral side of the knee, the palpatial tendon in inserts lateral to the, on the lateral epicondyle just in front of the lateral collateral ligament and underneath it, so the releases are performed in this area here. The iliotibial band is usually released off the iliotibial uh, or off of Gertie's tubercle or pie crusted just behind Gertie's tubercle. And lastly, the lateral collateral ligament is released off the epicondyle up in this area to balance the knee. Flexion deformities are evident as well. It's the same sequence. Osteophytes are first. Posterior capsule is next, followed by the gastrocnemius muscle, which inserts just behind the capsule. Remember, when releasing uh, flexion deformities, the posterior releases are performed with the knee flexed. There's less danger to the popliteal artery. In fact, the popliteal artery falls behind the knee, and it's much safer to do your releases, as you see here with the osteotome, re uh, removing the osteophytes, and then using a curve cob elevator to release the posterior capsule, and lastly, if need be, release the gastrocnemius uh, off the back of the femur. Moving on to sagittal plane balance, the goal here is full extension and full flexion on the table. Controlling variables include the bone cuts and soft tissue structures. We could refer to this as balancing the gaps. It's important for full knee range, stability, and lastly, pain relief. The flexion gap is controlled by these three factors, which is the posterior cut of the femur, the tibial cut, and the PCL. If you lose the PCL, the flexion gap pops open. In extension, the extension gap is controlled by the distal cut of the femur, the tibial cut again, and the posterior capsule. When looking at these test questions, it's easy to get flustered in the middle of the test, so I've come up with this rule. And I remember this when I teach the residents and also when I take my recertification exams. It's a, if it's a symmetrical problem, we tinker with the tibia first. If it's an asymmetrical problem, you tinker with the femur. And I'll go through every single rule as you see here. 
You're, in this scenario, you're tight in extension and tight in flexion. To emphasize, this is a symmetrical problem, so you look at the tibia first to make any changes. The problem here, you're loose, so you need to, or the, the problem here is you're tight in extension and flexion, and the solution here is to cut more tibia and remove more bone from the tibia to take care of the problem. The next scenario is loose in extension and loose in flexion. Again, a symmetrical problem, and what you do here is you tink tinker with the tibia. The solution here is to add polyethylene to the insert, and that'll take care of the problem, or if you want to, add metallic augmentations to the tibia and build it back up. You won't see these test questions very often. These are the ones here where you have the asymmetrical problems that they're going to test frequently that I see on the in training and on the self-assessment exams. So the next scenario is tight end extension, normal inflection, an asymmetrical problem. The problem here is uh, dealing with the femur, if, if you uh, listen to the rules. The problem is the, the femur is tight in extension. There's where the problem is, so you remove distal femur or you release the posterior capsule if there's a mild contracture. So conceptually, you're tight in extension, you remove uh, either the uh, posterior capsule and release it off of this area here, or uh, remove the distal femur. They will not ask both answers at the same time. They will pick one or two, one of these answers, either or, but not both of them together. The next scenario is normal extension and tight inflection, an asymmetrical problem. If you're on the test, you tinker with the femur, where is the problem? You're tight in flexion, so you remove more posterior femur or release the posterior cruciate ligament if there's a mild deformity. And always remember, check the posterior slope. So going through this scenario, the flushing gap is tight, so you want to cut more posterior femur. The AP gap is too full. You remove some of that posterior femur, put on a smaller femoral component, and the, and the problem is solved. If you are using a cruciate retaining knee, um, they will show you this picture or they will talk about the tibial trial lifting off. This is what it looks like when it lifts off. This tells you that the AP gap is too full. And if you're using a cruciate retaining knee, the PCL is tied in flexion. And this is where the PCL needs to be released. So this is what a PCL recession looks like. On the left, uh, the uh, tibial insert is lifting off. The PCL is released off, off of the intercolonal notch or you can release it off the tibia. This allows the flexion gap to increase in slow increments, allowing the tibia to sit back down in flexion, and this releases the flexion gap space to give you the balance needed to, to correct the knee. Always remember to check the posterior slope. If you have an anterior slope on your tibial cut, that will prevent uh, the knee from flexion. A normal posterior slope needs to be six to 10 degrees. So if you have problems with flexion, first check, always check posterior slope before thinking about doing your releases. Now the next gap scenario is normal extension and loose inflection. This is a more common problem, and this is more, more likely where you're going to see uh, some of the test questions. This is again an asymmetrical problem. You deal with the femur first. Where is the problem? You're loose in flexion. You want to address the posterior femur. You want to increase the size of the femoral component anterior to posterior, and this often requires posterior augmentation, or you can fill it with cement. So on the left, the flexion gap is loose. The solution here is to add a larger femoral component, fill up the gap with a metal augment or cement. Or another way to think about this is you can take your existing femoral component, cut down the tibia, and translate the femoral component posteriorly and fill up that gap with cement or a metal augmentation. Another way to answer this question is normal extension and loose inflection. You can add the tibia. But the problem here is that you'll end up with a, a tight extension gap, but that's okay. Then you readdress this as a tight, exten uh, tight extension gap uh, problem scenario and go back and look at the solutions for a tight extension gap, which is either cut more distal femur or release the posterior capsule. The next scenario is loose in extension and normal inflection. An asymmetrical problem, where do we go? We deal uh, with the femur. You tinker with the femur first. Here, uh, the problem is the distal femur. Uh, you want to bring that femoral component distal. That requires distal femoral augmentation. So diagrammatically, you've overcut the femur to begin with, and it's in hyperextension. Uh, you add the uh, augment in this area, 
that brings the uh, knee into full extension and solves the problem. If they don't have that answer for you, they may have this one, which is add the tibia, and that will take care of the extension problem, but when you bend the knee, you're going to be tight in flexion. Here, you'll have to readdress the problem with a tight flexion gap and go back through the tight flexion gap scenario. On technical aspects of the uh, total knee, patella management is important. It's not the most common problem or the most serious problems with patella management, but they're frequent and need to be adjusted. It's an exercise of cue angle management. You want to focus on proper component rotation, especially of the femur, and not overstuffing the patella femoral joint, which tends to pull the patella laterally. If you have an increased cue angle in the total knee, that's a problem because the prosthetic replacements are less restrained. They're domed rather than a V-group uh, native patella. And if you have increased lateral retinacular forces, they tend to sublux more easily than the native patella. So with the technique of total knee, you always want to reduce your excess uh, valgus. And the goal is neutral mechanical alignment always. No excuses these days with the current modular revision knee systems. All deformities can be corrected to a neutral mechanical alignment. These are the test questions that you're going to see. Thou shall not internally rotate the femoral component. That's the most common test question that we've seen over the years. And thou shall not internally rotate the tibial component. Avoid medializing the femoral component and avoid medializing the tibial component. Internal rotation of the femur is the most problematic. This gives you a relative lateral tilt of the patella. It pushes the uh, tibia or pushes the patella medial, increasing your cue angle, and gives you an un unbalanced flexion gap, giving you kinematic conflict. Diagrammatically, internal rotation of the femur looks like this. You can see that the trochlea has pushed the patella on the medial side. You have a trapezoidal flexion gap where you have relative lateral tilt of the patella. You have a loose lateral compartment giving you instability or a tight medial compartment which gives you stiffness, both of which cause pain and require revision. What you want to do is actually rotate the femur. Uh, this gives you a, a rectangular flexion gap, gives you central tracking of patella, gives you good stability, no stiffness, pain-free knee, good function. But the question is, how much do you actually rotate the femur? Well, it boils down to the native knee and the dirty little secret is, is that the proximal tibia is just about uh, three to five degrees of varus. And the native femur matches that in flexion. So if we cut our tibia at 90 degrees to provide equal loading of the tibial implant medial and lateral, our femoral component still is rotated inward and you'll have a trapezoidal flexion gap. Therefore, if you want to match the 90 degree cut that we made with the tibial implant, we must externally rotate the femur three to five degrees to balance that gap and get a, f a rectangular flexion gap and give you the stability needed. There's where we have that problem with excess internal rotation. And also beware, lateral femoral condylar hypoplasia is a problem. If you use the posterior condylar axis where you put your two foot pads underneath the femur, you will be left with an internally rotated femoral component. Why? Because the hypoplastic lateral femoral condyle is a lot smaller than the native femur, and three degrees is not enough. What you need is to use the epicondylar axis or the AP axis uh, of white side to externally rotate that femur to match up the flexion gap in flexion and have a balanced gap. So again, the alternative method uh, to set that rotation, epicondylar axis or the AP axis. This is what lateral femoral condylar hypoplasia looks like for the radiographs. Again, a small lateral femoral condyle. If you see this type of x-ray, think about avoiding uh, the posterior condylar pads uh, for referencing for rotation. Internal rotation of the tibia is also a problem. It increases cue angle. Uh, the tibial component position should lie over the medial one half of the tibial tubercle. If not, then you have problems with increased cue angle. On the left, the tibial component, as you see, is located over the medial half of the tibial tubercle. If you internally rotate that tibial component, that results in a relative external rotation of the tibial tubercle. The problem is if you externally rotate the tibial tubercle, that results in an increased Q angle. If you increase the Q angle, you increase the patella subluxation forces, resulting in patella subluxation as the patella domes are less restrained than the native patella.
Mutilization of the femoral component or the uh, femoral implant is to be avoided. This moves the patellar groove medial relative to the tibial tubercle. There is a net increase in the Q angle. Lateralization is okay. So if you have a wide femur, you can move that femoral component to the lateral side, decrease in the Q angle, and uh, improves patellar tracking. Patella medialization is a little trick you can use to uh, increase and improve your patella male tracking. There's a net decrease in the Q angle. Why is that? Because the center of the patella dome is medial to the center of the patella tendon. Remember, we measure Q angle through the patella tendon and quadricep tendon. So the patella tendon is laterally, uh, laterally placed in this uh, technique. Therefore, the Q angle is lower and therefore the subluxation forces are less. Patella height is important. You want to restore the total thickness. You always want to measure the native patella before you cut and resurface and you make sure that it's the same thickness afterwards. Otherwise you'll have increased uh, normal or increased retinacular tension and that causes overpull. So what you want is normal uh, retinacular tension, no lateral overpull. However, if you increase this gap and go up higher, then you're going to put tension on that lateral side and that's going to pull the patella laterally resulting in subluxation and male tracking as you see on this x-ray. So overstuffing the patella is a problem. You want to avoid it. You want to measure before you cut and after you resurface to make sure that everything is the same. The problems uh, that you can incur is a thin bone cut of the patella as you see here. You can put in a, a thick polyethylene implant. You can make a too thin of a bone cut on the trochlea, or you can use a femoral component design with a really thick trochlea, and you add all four of them together, you, uh, you have a really big problem with a tight rec retinaculum that tends to pull laterally. Also remember, technical, technically, if you see maltracking uh, during the case, the first thing you do is release the tourniquet and then reevaluate before making any changes. Remember, the tourniquet can falsely create an increased lateral pull on the quadricep and patella tendon. And even though you're actually really well balanced, you let the tourniquet down, that will relax the quadricep and the patella tendon, and therefore your tracking uh, will be uh, ameliorated in terms of reduced tension, and you won't have to perform any of those above releases. In regards to patella resurfacing, in North America, most people resurface. They're not going to ask you the pros and cons of which is the best way to go. But remember that the absolute indication to resurface the patella is inflammatory arthritis. In this scenario, you have cartilage antigens causing inflammatory disease and pain, and that's the absolute indication to resurface a patella. You'll see a lot of test questions on complications. Uh, perineal nerve palsy is one of them. The deformity most likely to cause uh, perineal, pul perineal nerve palsy and total knee is valgus and flexion deformity together. The most common cause to see a perineal nerve palsy without deformity is a barren retractor placement where you place it in the posterior lateral corner next to the fibula and put pressure on the perineal nerve causing the palsy. If you see a perineal nerve palsy post-op in the recovery room, the first thing you do is always take off the compressive wraps and flex the knee to relax the nerve. If the nerve is not cut, test by nerve studies, most nerve palsies will resolve in three months. If you still have a nerve palsy at three months and you've done your EMG nerve conducting studies and there shows no evidence of a nerve cut, the next step is to decompress the nerve, just like an ulnar nerve compression or decompression at the elbow. The tunnel is tight. Uh, you've corrected the valgus deformity. The tunnel has increased the pressure on the nerve. You open the tunnel, decompress the nerve, and slowly the nerve will regain its function uh, after the release. The lateral retinacular release is a problem. Uh, we do this for patellar maltracking, and again, if you obey the rules that we just talked about, you can avoid that. But if you do an over-vigorous lateral retinacular release, uh, the problem is transection of the lateral superior genicular artery. This is the only artery left over after the medial arthrotomy and fat pad removal. If you uh, uh, ex uh, incise uh, and perform the lateral retinacular release and you cut the lateral superior genicular artery, you'll have an increased risk for AV on the patella. And basically what you'll see uh, months later is fragmentation of the patella on x-ray. And you'll think that this is an acute fracture. No, it's not an acute fracture. It's just AVN with fragmentation of patella as you have cut this artery.
Patella fracture causes, number one, again, is a big lateral retinacular release causing AVN with fragmentation. The other problem is over-resection of the patella bone. The minimum thickness required is 13 millimeters to keep the strength of the bone uh, with, uh, without losing its integrity. Patella femoral maltracking can cause overload on the patella to fracture, and then there's um, direct trauma from falls. Rule uh, number one, if you have a moving on to periprosthetic femur fractures, rule number one, if the implant is loose, the answer is revision of the total knee plus RF of the fracture. So anytime the implants show mechanical loosening radiographically, or they tell you on the test question that the implants are loose, you want to revise the knee. In this scenario, we use a spine stem into the diaphysis to provide rotational stability of the implant. If the femoral implant is stable, the answer is a pre-molded supraconar plate, which is the best choice using locking screws as an option. Always a possibility that's acceptable as a revision knee if you have a symptomatic total knee, such as the case with osteolysis and, or some issues of kinematic conflict. But they're not going to ask that part. That's too controversial. What they'll ask you is straightforward uh, scenarios such as this. If the implant is stable, ORF with a lateral reconstruction plate is the first choice. In fact, submuscular plating is the best choice, which lowers the non-union rate compared to the extensile approach. And remember, if the implants are loose, the answer is revision of the total knee. Another test question that you will see is the highly comminuted segmental fracture in the elderly patient. This is a patient who suffers from osteoporosis. So they're going to ask you this test question very succinctly. Elderly patient, comminuted fracture, osteoporosis. The best answer is a femoral endoprosthesis, which allows early mobilization and full weight bearing. Arthrofibrosis, or the stiff knee after total knee, is a common uh, test question that you'll see. Typically, the scenario is uh, the patient's uh, knee gets stuck between 70 to 85 degrees of flexion. The therapists report that the knee can't bend any further. Interoperatively, you have had this knee to 120 degrees with good ligament balance. Your choice here is to manipulate that knee between six or eight weeks. The range is four to 12 weeks, which is acceptable. And remember, any manipulation after 12 weeks has a high rate of fracture, usually at the femur. Late stiffness is a problem. If you see it, uh, this means uh, that there's some issues of kinematic conflict. Uh, you haven't balanced the knee. Arthrotomy with scar resection and reduction of the, of the polyethylene thickness is not recommended and is not the answer for the test. This gives you a high failure rate of 40 to 50 percent. So it's late stiffness means kinematic conflict, and this requires revision. Post-op flexion contractures, remember this test question, in a well-balanced knee where you have full range of motion on the table, full extension, full flexion, afterwards you get a flexion contracture. What's going on here? The patient's usually resting the knee on a pillow. You get hamstring tightness and spasm. The treatment is not revision of the knee or manipulation. It's therapy, therapy, therapy. You want to keep that knee straight and rest. And remember, no pillows underneath during your post-op uh, rehab protocols. Moving on to total knee design, we look at the constraint continuum. We start off with knee designs that keep the PCL. Moving on to sacrificing uh, designs where you remove the PCL. And the more difficult problems where we use the constrained non-hinge prosthesis or the hinge, these are usually reserved for the complex primary with big deformities or the revision uh, knee scenario where you're missing ligament function and they need to be replaced. Starting off with the, uh, the most uh, conserving uh, design, which is the PCL retention. Uh, those are uh, where the PCL is maintained. The uh, next step is PCL resection, where you substitute the PCL with a spine and cam mechanism, or you can substitute it with an anterior polyethylene lip, also known as the anterior stabilized knee. Long-term success is reported with each design, and they're not going to ask you the advantage of one knee over the other in terms of long-term survivorship, but they are going to tell you about the pros and cons of each of these designs. The CR design, or the crucial retaining design, uh, the PCL assists in flexion. It controls the posterior translation of the femur, and generally you see more flat inserts. It's bone conserving because you don't take the bone from the middle of the knee. There's more consistent joint line restoration because you keep the PCL and it doesn't allow that flexion gap to pop open.
However, it's harder to balance with severe deformities. If you uh, keep the PCL, it's hard to swing the knee around. Releasing the PCL really helps with those big varus and valgus knee deformities. A tight PCL inflection causes excess polyethylene wear and leads to osteolysis. That's why you have to balance that PCL, and that's why some surgeons don't like using the system because if you over-release, then you're unstable. So you want to avoid that lift-off phenomenon that I previously showed. Recessing the PCL off the femur or, or the tibia is acceptable. The problem is excess PCL recession. This can result in late failure causing flexion instability, and for the test, flexion instability, for whatever reason, whether it's with a CR knee or another knee design, is characterized by instability, effusion, chronic pain, the inability to reciprocate stairs, and, unable, and the inability to get up from a low chair. If you see that scenario, what they're telling you is it's a flexion instability problem, and that's how you are going to address that test question. Moving on to the next design, which is a PCL substitution, there's two options. You can replace it with a spine and cam mechanism to give you the posterior stability needed. That's called a posterior stabilized knee, or you can use an extended anterior lip, also known as the anterior stabilized knee or ultracongruent knee. This is a PS implant. You have a spine and a cam. The cam engages the posterior flexion. This controls rollback, and usually you have disc inserts which are congruent. The advantage is it's easier balancing and severe deformities, as we talked about, the big varus and valgus deformities. You have controlled flexion kinematics with the spine and cam, so there's no sliding wear with this design. The problem is femoral cam jump. This occurs when the flexion gap is left loose. When you see this, this requires revision to address the loose flexion gap. If you do have a cam jump, the closed reduction maneuver is placed in the knee at 90 degrees of flexion of under anesthesia. Distract the knee and do an anterior drawer, and that takes care of this problem. This is what it looks like uh, interoperatively. On the left, you have a flexion uh, gap that's loose. Specifically, you have a palpiteal tendon that's been released too much, and this pacing falls into a figure four position. This gap will open up, and the femur will jump over and, and will come in the resting position anteriorly. This is a cam jump. Radiographically, a cam jump looks like this, where the femur is in front of the post, or if you come into extension, the knee literally falls forward of the tibia. The causes are, of, are a loose flexion gap. This means anterior translation of the femur. So if you've uh, left the femur too anterior, uh, with the anterior referencing technique, that leaves you with a loose flexion gap. You can over-release the palpiteus on the lateral side or over-release of the anterior portion of the superficial MCL, as you remember back in the prior slides. The disadvantage of the posterior stabilized knee also is patellar clunk. This is unique to the posterior stabilized knee and not to any other knee design. This is where scar tissue as superior to patella gets caught in the box as the knee comes from a from flexion into extension. The scar catches and then releases with a big clunk causing pain and it's audible across the room. It's usually evident at about 30 to 45 degrees of flexion. The answers to treatment of the patella clunk are arthroscopic removal of the scar or a small arthrotomy with removal of the scar. Preventive treatment includes synovectomy of the quadricep tendon at the time of total knee. This is what it looks like arthroscopically. There's a nodule superior to the patella the nodule gets incarcerated into the box, and then you force the knee into extension, and it pops out, causing that clunk syndrome. Lastly, the slide on the right shows resection of that nodule arthroscopically, or again, you can do this with a small mini arthrotomy. To prevent this from happening, you want to remove this fibroinflammatory debris superior to the patella and remove it right at this level of the quadricep tendon so it doesn't form into a, a nodule scar, causing the problem. Another disadvantage of the PS knee is polyethylene wear on the tibial post. This is a service that can cause wear and osteolysis. In fact, aseptic loosening and osteolysis are correlated with tibial post wear and damage. If the knee hyperextends, the femoral box can impinge on the anterior tibial post. The tibial post causes, gets damaged and causes fatigue and can break. And this increases also polyethylene wear debris causing osteolysis. So the anterior post wear occurs when the superior edge of the femoral box contacts the anterior post and occurs when the components are in net hyperextension. So remember, net hyperextension.
This is an example of tibial polyethylene post wear. You can see the top of the box engages on the anterior tibia. So if that femoral component is flexed or there's increased slope on the tibial component, you will see that this knee will fall into a little bit of hyperextension, causing that post wear, causing the osteolysis debris, or over time that post will break, causing instability of the knee. Another problem with posterior stabilized knee is fractures. This most commonly occurs in the medial femoral condyle. As you can see, the, the box cut in this small knee uh, comes very close to the medial femur. Uh, that bone remove is a disadvantage for those patients with small knees, especially in the Pan Pacific area where the anthrop anthropometric uh, size of the femur is relatively small relative to the cut of the bone. The flexion gap when you remove the PCL is a problem. Again, you pop up, you uh, release the PCL that pops open. That means you need a more of a, of a tibial insert uh, in flexion. And when you bring it into extension, you're going to have a flexion contracture that requires either a posterior capsule release or cutting more femur. Beware about releasing too much femur because the maximum joint line elevation allowed is eight millimeters. Otherwise, you're going to have kinematic conflict with the collateral ligaments. The absolute indication for using a posterior stabilized knee design for the boards is patelectomy or inflammatory disease where you have erosion of the PCL or traumatic rupture of the PCL uh, with uh, any prior trauma or at the time of surgery, you over recess the PCL and it pops off and you, you don't have a PCL left, which is a good segue to the anterior stabilized implant. Some, uh, it's always a problem when you over-release the PCL with a CR design, you have to switch over to posterior stabilized implant. In the last decade, uh, there have been new designs coming out, which we know as the anterior stabilized implant. This stability is provided with the anterior lip and a congruent bearing. The anterior lip is about the same height as the posterior stabilized post, and this gives you the stability and flexion comparable to a posterior stabilized knee. The advantage is, Again, easier balancing and severe deformities. It's bone conserving, so if you balance the PCL and you over-release it, instead of switching to a PS knee, you put in an ultracongruent insert and the problem is solved. And that's the alluring feature of using an anterior stabilized bearing in the armamentarium using a crucial retaining knee design. The disadvantage, again, is polyethylene wear. If you have an increased anterior lip, you have an increased surface area with polyethylene wear. You don't have any rollback mechanism, so you must adjust with the implant design. The posterior uh, center rotation needs to be offset posteriorly, and you need to use a posterior slope to maintain and, gain and regain your flexion with this technique. So it's a fastidious technique to maintain your flexion. Flexion gap laxity, again, is a problem resulting in instability and pain. The same scenario as before uh, with inability to reciprocate stairs, knee pain, and effusion. Uh, also, with this, you'll see a posterior drawer sign because without the post, the knee will tend to sublux a little bit posteriorly. And remember the flexion gap uh, instability pattern that we talked about previously. Modularity is the standard for total knee replacements. Uh, you have a metal base plate, uh, modular tibial insert, so you can adjust uh, at the last minute any uh, problems with flexion or extension and make sure that you've fine-tuned your knee. You can use stems to provide uh, stability to the bone for osteoporosis. The problem um, with this is uh, polyethylene wear debris, but again, the advantage is greater interoperative flexibility. You can perform a modular bearing change for worn polyethylene inserts and well-fixed implants at 13 to 15 years. Backside polyethylene wear continues to be a problem. There's more osteolysis with modular designs Locking mechanism are just not good enough with the base plate uh, to control that micro motion. The backside of the tibial polyethylene moves despite various locking mechanisms giving increased risk for osteolysis. And remember, if you have what we call a monolock design, uh, the, the polyethylene is molded onto the tibia at the time of factory. Uh, these do not have micro motion. So remember, monoblock designs, either an all polyethylene tibia or a monoblock tibia with metal on it, you don't see that problem. However, there's no modularity with a monoblock, and you can't make those last minute adjustments during your trialing. If you see this x-ray, this is a modular polyethylene dissociation. You don't go in and replace the polyethylene. This requires full revision. The bearing surfaces are scratched and damaged. 
problems also include poor ligament balance, poor alignment, and osteolysis. If you have poor alignment or poor balancing, the stresses are so much that, it, uh, that the polyethylene locking mechanism fails. If you see failure, that means that you really have not done a good job balancing your knee. And again, I reiterate, a full revision is required for polyethylene dissociation as you see here. Osteolysis is the problem late in the life of the process. It's usually after seven to 10 years. Uh, there's a gradual increase in fusion with weight-bearing pain. There's mild warmth. Uh, the knee's not too hot. You have normal infection labs. Uh, the aspiration is negative. X-rays show round lytic lesions behind the implant, and it's usually the most common site is behind the posterior femoral condyles. This is the classic appearance of osteolysis. This looks like tumors around the knee, but it's not. These are just areas of osteolysis. The cell involved is the macrophage, and the, these are the classic X-rays of osteolysis. Clinically, it looks like this. You have these round lytic lesions. These are filled with bone graft or metallic augmentations. Moving on to constraint, uh, why do we use constraint? The soft tissues about the knee won't support the prosthesis. There's loss of the ligament structures. The prosthesis must then accommodate for the loss of support. The options include a high tibial post, which is non-hinged, a hinge with a rotating platform, or a uniplanar hinge, which is rarely used. It's too constrained. There's a high rate of loosening with the uniplanar hinges and is not the answer for the boards. This is a constrained prosthesis with a high central post. This substitutes for the collateral ligament function. It limits varus and valgus uh, movements and limits rotation. The number one indication for a constrained hinge or a constrained non-hinged knee replacement is residual flexion gap laxity. You just can't balance the gaps good enough in a revision, so you add the post to give you the stability. Usually the MCL is attenuated or the lateral collateral ligament is deficient. These are acceptable. The relative contraindications are MCL deficiency and Charcot. You will not be asked these for the boards because these overlap with the indications for a hinge. Moving on to a hinge, the femur and tibia are connected uh, with a bar and with bearings. There's a fixed extension stop so the knee does not come into hyperextension. You have a rotating uh, platform to offload the stresses on the knee to reduce the torque stresses to the implant and lower the loosening rates to the stems. The main indications include global instability, trauma or infection, hyperextension instability. This is the absolute indication for a hinge, especially in post-polio patients or endoresection, such as with a fracture or a tumor. MCL deficiency is relative, as is Charcot deficiency, as they overlap with the non-constrained high post knee. This is an example of hyperextension instability in a post-polio uh, post patient. The only solution here is a hinge, and the solution was this, which is a hinge prosthesis, and this controls hyperextension with an extension stop. With uh, revision total knee, they're not going to ask you the details, but they're going to ask you the principles. Revision of a painful knee without an identified cause has a poor outcome, so you've got to in identify intrinsic versus uh, extrinsic sources of pain. Extrinsic sources of pain, the most common missed diagnosis is a, a uh, hip with arthritis. This is the most common missed uh, diagnosis. Referred pain from the spine, typically the L3 or L4 root, or extraarticular pain at the knee, especially with a chronic regional pain syndrome. Intrinsic sources of pain include mechanical loosening, which you'll see radiographically, osteolysis, which you will see with effusion and uh, radiographic uh, lytic lesions, malpositioning, malalignment, instability. Also infection, which gives you constant global pain. That would be the cue for you to think about infection. Infection studies are positive. Remember for the evaluation blood test at number one, infection is high on the list, so you want to uh, evaluate with your CVC, CRP, and SED rate. You want to aspirate the knee looking for uh, infection, any blood or metal debris to suggest mechanical loosening or uh, osteolysis. A monitor bearing change for rapid wear is a problem. So a total knee uh, wears out and you have a polyethylene bearing that's changed at five, five years, beware. If you're having to do a polyethylene change between five and seven years, the problem is uh, problems with inability to uh, balance the knee or unappreciated malalignment. 
this polyethylene will again fail rapidly, and the board answer is to revise this knee rather than move forward with another bearing change. So early polyethylene wear in five to seven years is a big tip off to think about doing a revision and not doing a bearing change. Bearing changes should be done typically between 13 to 15 years. The uh, surgical approach is using prior incisions. You want to avoid making skin bridges and causing necrosis of the skin. Lifting a subcutaneous flap is much better than uh, making a second incision. For the difficult exposure, the order is an extended proximal arthrotomy all the way up to the end of the tendon. You want to externally rotate the tibia with posterior release of the posterior medial corner, allowing the tibia to be externally rotated. This allows access to the lateral side of the knee where you debride the patella tendon and the patella getting into the uh, lateral gutter. And then lastly, quadricep snip. You want to avoid what we call a quadricep turndown where you devascularize the entire quadricep. They heal poorly and, and you are left with a, a clinical lag. For periprosthetic infection, the risk factors include diabetes, number one, smoking, number two, prior surgeries, and obesity, BMI greater than 40 have been correlated with infection, autoimmune inflammatory disease, psoriatic arthritis stands out. Those little psoriatic lesions are literally bacterial cities uh, where uh, in, a bacteria may invade into the skin incision and cause infection. Immune system disorders, including uh, mild dysplastic syndromes, and also remember, allogeneic blood transfusion are an independent risk factor for transfusion. This uh, uh, alters the modulation of the immune system when, you, when giving allogeneic blood. Remember, immune suppression drugs, specifically the anti-TNF alpha agents, they all end in AB. So if you see uh, any of these chemicals here with AB at the end, this is an anti-TNF agent. You want to avoid these if at all possible, uh, uh, before your surgery. Immune suppression drugs including glucocorticoids, anti-metabolites such as methotrexate and Arava, and uh, these other agents. Periprosthetic infections, um, you'll see this on the test question. Uh, the definite diagnosis, number one, based on the international consensus meetings, a draining sinus that communicates to the joint. If you see a draining sinus, that is a chronic infection. That is absolute diagnosis doesn't matter what the rest of the test question shows if you see a draining sinus that's a chronic infection and you treat it as a chronic infection these are examples of draining sinuses around the knee they can occur anywhere they can go all the way from the mid tibia to the back of the knee if you see a draining sinus anywhere nearby a knee this means it's coming from the knee joint and it's a chronic infection, and this is the driving uh, test question to tell you that this is a chronic infection. The definite diagnosis number two is a pathogen isolated from two different cultures at two separate uh, uh, time periods. So this is either from fluid or tissues uh, using or obtaining a positive culture with the same organism. This is an absolute diagnosis of a chronic periprosthetic infection or you have four of the six of the following criteria. You have an elevated CRP or SED rate, that's one. For chronic infection, a white cell count greater than 2,500 is now the standard with greater than 70% neutrophils. Those are two different uh, ticks that you can use. One positive culture, greater than five white cells per high power field on five different fields tested at 400 uh, power or gross purulence in the joint. So if you have four of those six, that's a definite diagnosis of a chronic periprosthetic infection and the implants need to be removed. Also remember for the uh, board questions, I've seen this twice, spontaneous onset of wound drainage in a previously dry perioperative wound. So the knee is doing well, the patient's sent home, two and a half weeks, three weeks later, you have drainage from the knee. Everybody thinks, so. Oh, that's a little bit of suture uh, drainage. Not so, this usually indicates a uh, infection and you've got to think very uh, aggressively in this scenario and wash that knee out to prevent a chronic periprosthetic infection. So again, spontaneous onset of a draining wound is a clip or is a tip off for uh, infection. For periprosthetic infection treatment, an acute infection means that the infection hasn't uh, set up into a biofilm. Uh, a biofilm state means that the infection can't be cured. The biofilm has to be removed with removal of the implants. 
So for the timeline for the boards, and you look at the test questions, an acute infection means less than three to four weeks of symptoms. So a hot, swollen knee with pain and debility. The answer here is an irrigation agreement with component retention. You do a monitor bearing exchange with IV antibiotics for four to six weeks. And for the board, arthroscopic lavage is not acceptable. That is a wrong answer. It's always an open arthrotomy. Aggressive lavage with a radical synovectomy to, to debulk the bacteria from the joint and perform a monitor bearing change. And lastly, for a chronic paraprosthetic infection, the infection has been present for more than th three or four weeks of duration. So if they ask you on the test that the patient's been symptomatic for six or eight weeks, that is a chronic infection. That means a biofilm state. A biofilm forms from the bacteria. It is a polysaccharide coating uh, encompassing the bacteria and enveloping the implant. The answer here is a two-stage resection, which is recommended. In this scenario, the implants are removed vigorously, aggressively debrided. You're stabilized with an antibiotic impregnated methylmethylate spacer with antibiotics. A static spacer is used when the ligaments are damaged or an articulated uh, spacer uh, is used if you have intact ligaments. As using an articulated spacer preserves uh, ligament function and the studies do show increased function and improved function uh, at reimplantation. So with that said, I want to thank you all for your uh, attention in this subject. And again, thank you, Mark Miller, for all of his diligent work that he's done over the last two, two decades in educating us. Thank you.